Hello everyone, this week we will be talking about our last play of the semester, which is The Tragedy Coriolanus by William Shakespeare. We'll start off with the historical background of the play, so we can understand where the play's historical and creative content were coming from. So the play was written in 1608, which is interesting because that's around the time of the Midland Revolt, which was a series of peasant riots in England which were caused by the sectioning off of public land for the use of private wealthy citizens. And this sectioning off of land directly led to food shortages for poorer citizens who depended on the public space for livestock and farming. This event provides insight into what was going through Shakespeare's creative mind at the time. And being a landowner himself, he feared rebellion and the loss of his land and life at the hand of starving and angry peasants, which directly ties in with the plebeian riots in Coriolanus being angry at the consuls for not distributing enough grain to the people. Also adding to his content, Shakespeare, like in all of his plays, draws upon outside sources for content, and Coriolanus is no exception. He relies heavily on the works of the Roman historian Plutarch and his piece, The Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romans, which was translated heavily in England, in England and included the life of Coriolanus, which Shakespeare most certainly read and drew upon. In regards to ancient historical content of the play, it is based on the story of the Roman general Caius Martius Coriolanus. Unlike Julius Caesar, this play does not occur when Rome was an all-powerful empire, but instead a more ancient time when Italy was still a collection of warring city-states and Rome was anything but invulnerable. This climate sets the stage for a more unstable, violent, and dramatic Rome, not the white marble palaces and people walking around in Toga's Rome that we envision today. Coriolanus takes place shortly after the deposition and banishment of the Tarquin kings, which foreshadows what will eventually happen to Coriolanus, because Tarquin was considered a tyrant to the people and was deposed for being so and ignoring the well-being of the people and also their wishes. In terms of popularity and performances, Coriolanus has endured. But when compared to other tragedies such as Hamlet, Othello, or King Lear, it is often forgotten about. It is a source of intense debate whether or not the play was performed prior to the Restoration. This is due possibly to its anti-authoritative sentiments and rebellious overtones, which were liable at the time to spark real insurrection in England. Despite this, certain performances are remembered. Some going back as far as 1682, with an incredibly bloody adaptation by Nahum Tate. Its proliferation of performances over time can be attributed to the political climate of the time it was performed. And as time has progressed, elements of the play have been changed to better fit the political climate of the contemporary audience. Over the past century, Coriolanus has been adapted into films, operas, and television, which has cemented its status as a lasting drama which still appeals to a modern audience. The pliability of its themes and its ability to exemplify certain notions of humanity has allowed it to appeal to a wide array of audiences over time in all forms of media. The role has even garnered famous acting talents such as Laurence Olivier, Ralph Fiennes, and Tom Hiddleston, showing a desire to play the title role even among high-profile actors, despite its lack of notoriety when compared to other tragedies. Coriolanus takes place in Rome after the deposition of the Tarquin kings and is centered around the life and death of the Roman general Caius Martius Coriolanus. The play begins with a riot of the plebeians, the lower class citizens of Rome, in regards to the Senate not providing the people with enough grain to live on. This riot is met by the, the general Caius Martius, and he is outraged at the notion that the common people are not grateful for what the Senate does for them which shows the people that Martius isn't concerned with their, their well-being, but instead the well-being of Rome as a whole, the senators, consuls, and upper class. This also leads to the tribunes Brutus and Sinicus, who represent the plebeians, to denounce him. Martius is then called into battle because the Volscians, a rival tribe in Italy led by Martius's royal enemy and Volscian general Tullus of Phidias, are at war, and Martius takes his army to take the Volscian city of Corioli, and despite difficulty, takes the city, and then helps defeat the greater Volscian force. This great victory earns him the surname Coriolanus, taken from his victory at Corioli, and earns him respect from the Senate, and this success and encouragement from his mother lead to his attempt to run for consul. However, due to his pride, honesty, and lack of political decorum, and the 
schemes of Brutus and Senecus, become enraged and condemns the people, and loses their favor, and is eventually banished. Coriolanus then travels to the Volscian capital and seeks out Aphidius, and asks him to kill him d to spite Rome. Aphidius instead respects Coriolanus and spares him, and gives him charge of an army to attack Rome and take his revenge. Coriolanus then proceeds with his assault on Rome, and as he marches towards Rome, several attempts to make peace are spurned, until eventually his mother, son, and wife come to him and beg for peace. Coriolanus finally gives in and makes peace with Rome, but when he meets Aphidius again, he is killed by Aphidius and his men for his betrayal. There are several themes present in Coriolanus which make it an intriguing and engaging play. The first theme is power. The ruling class has all the power. The plebeians are rioting in the street, and a brooding hero is about to swoop in to save the day. Early Republican Rome has just transitioned from being ruled by a monarch to a government by elected officials. With the last tyrant king, everyone is demanding and searching for power. Shakespeare captures a struggle for social and political power. The next theme is family. By embellishing Rome's social and political problems, the play suggests that those who hold all the power in a multifaceted society have a duty to care for the common men, just like parents have an obligation to care for their children. Maybe the plebeians are better off being neglected. Shakespeare shows us one form of familial love, Cor Coriolanus's crazy dysfunctional mom, who fails to nurture her son and instead raises him to be a killing machine. She basks in the glory of his middle military and political achievements. Another theme is gender. If you're a woman in Coriolanus, you have two choices. Volumnia, who is domineering, aggressive, and vocal. Or Virgilia, the typical 17th century woman who is chaste and obedient. Shakespeare's original audience would have associated her to the ideal woman. As for men, well, they are depicted as aggressive both on and off the battlefield. And the final theme is pride. Coriolanus' main problem is his pride. It partly arises from his remarkable warlike qualities, but it prevents him from making necessary compromises to become a great political leader. If he were not so proud, he would be viewed by the plebeians both as a war hero and a suitable consul. He even responds to his banishment with pride by claiming that he is the one who is banishing the Roman people. Coriolanus is widely regarded as a great Shakespeare play and is often performed in full productions and has numerous adaptations, but isn't considered in the upper echelon of Shakespeare's tragedies. This can be attributed to how the main character Coriolanus appeals to audiences. Coriolanus is a paradox who creates a love-hate relationship with the audience. Throughout the play, Coriolanus doesn't have any asides or sol soliloquies, where he contemplates his actions and possibly shows remorse or any other, other emotion other than pride and anger. But Coriolanus is unapologetically co coarse and prideful and sees no sh reason for sugarcoating his opinions to please others. This hubris, paired with his views of the upper class's duty of enforcing rule, often draws the comparison to a fascist dictator. And in fact, during the 1930s, performances of the play in France were banned due to the fact that it was seen as pro-fascist doctrine. His heavy-handedness and brutish speech can make the audience detest Coriolanus, but at the same time, his discipline, unwavering loyalty to his values, and his service for the country is also admired. Being a creation of war, he had to become rough, uncompromising, and fierce to survive, and that behavior isn't often well received by society, who often wants the protection of these savage war machines that the military creates, but doesn't necessarily want to acknowledge their existence. And when they do, they expect them to behave like normal people, despite this mindset not being like a light switch and is unable to be turned off and on. Coriolanus is exactly the man he is supposed to be, but in the realm of politics, with its facades and scheming, it preys upon those who are proud and unwavering and turns them into villains to be destroyed by the society. This dynamic polarizes audiences of the play and poses the question of whether Coriolanus is a tyrannical villain who got what he deserved or if he's the unfortunate soldier who was swallowed up by the ruthless world of politics. This polarization manifests in the play as the common people representing the audience who detest Coriolanus and are likely to start chanting with the cast on stage as they riot and condemn Coriolanus. The other spectrum has Aphidius, though being a mortal enemy respects Coriolanus 
for his honor and military service, and even sets aside his own hate, and this represents the audience members who respect Coriolanus and even possibly pity his situation. As previously stated, Shakespeare drew heavily upon Plutarch's life of Caius Marcius Coriolanus. However, although the majority of the content is similar, there are key differences between the works. As with any production of an adaptation of a historical event for entertainment, certain liberties are taken to make the piece more engaging in entertainment, and Shakespeare certainly does that. Shakespeare takes Coriolanus' best qualities of pride and honor and uses it against him, which Plutarch does not elaborate on. Also, Shakespeare does away with Plutarch's political savvy to create a more dramatic gap between the spheres of military and political service to better emphasize Coriolanus's epic political failure. This disconnect between historical accuracy and creative interpretation goes further than Shakespeare and Plutarch due to the fact that Coriolanus may not even have existed. It's debated among historians whether or not Coriolanus was simply a legendary figure or whether he was indeed the great Roman general we know today. The question of his exi existence brings up an interesting idea of Plutarch writing about someone's life as a fact and Shakespeare taking that and changing it for the theater when perhaps it was intended to be originally didactic and entertaining in the first place. It is interesting to imagine Shakespeare, who is often criticized for copying the work of his contemporaries, accidentally plagiarize someone's ancient attempt to do the same. Shakespeare also translates some of Plutarch's writings into more contemporary issues. In Plutarch's biography, the plebeians revolted because they were promised easier terms on loans if they agreed to fight the nearby Sabines. After the fighting was done, the plebeians were sold into slavery. In Shakespeare's Coriolanus, the plebeians' primary grievance was hunger. They claimed the rich were hiding food in order to drive up food prices. And instead of cultivating cereal grains, they were replaced with the more lucrative sheep farming. The manipulation of issues to make the play more relevant is the prime example of how culturally aware Shakespeare really was, and how he had his finger on the pulse of Elizabethan society. His knowledge of the necessity of making themes culturally flexible is what allowed Shakespeare to remain culturally relevant to this day. To bring this whole idea full circle, modern society is constantly contemporizing Shakespeare, and in particular, Coriolanus being altered because some audience may not clearly see these themes and apply them to our modern world when they see people running around in togas on stage and people dressed as Roman soldiers. Ralph Fiennes' 2011 production does a fantastic job of altering the stage by taking Rome and placing it in a modern city, using television and news to replace messengers and people speaking in the public forum, and instead of legionnaires with swords, he has commandos with assault rifles. Yet, he maintains the language to keep that connection to the original text, and the combination of these two elements makes an otherwise detached social commentary about, social, about Elizabethan England into a gritty and engaging commentary on modern politics and leadership. Coriolanus surprisingly resonates with modern society, with current distrust of political leaders, simultaneous vilification and admiration of the military, and the sentiment that the general public's voice falls on deaf ears of the rich and powerful, who are seen as the only ones who have a say when it comes to how the country is ran. So here are references, and I would suggest reading the New York Times article on the third link. Um, also, I'd recommend watching the Ralph Fiennes adaptation, and Gerard Butler's in that as well, because it does a really good job of modernizing the play, like we said, and it also makes it a little bit more interesting and exciting to watch when you have special effects as opposed to people running around with swords on stage. Okay, um, thanks for watching, and I hope this helped understand the play a little bit and enjoy the play.